in 2009, I was a Google employee, when the entire company had this collective, oh crap moment. The data came out that iPhone owners weren't searching the web. iPhone owners were consuming the web in a way that had never really been done before. Up to 2009, the web was a destination. It was a place you went to and then, and then did things. And that all changed. That all changed, <clears throat> excuse me, because of ads. iPhone owners didn't use the web through a browser, they used the web through apps. And this is fundamentally different. It's fundamentally a better way to do it. We play this game when we go to lunch at Microsoft. We all eat, and at the end, we throw our credit cards down, and we play a game. Right? The game is, we ask the waiter or waitress, ask us anything, pop culture, sports, ask us anything. We all pull our phones out. This is so nerdy. This is so nerdy. We pull our phones out, and here she will say something like, uh, uh, who was the last Seattle Sounder to score a goal? Wow, we just go for it, right? And it doesn't matter if you know the answer. Your phone's got to know the answer. And then the first person to hold it up gets to take their credit card out. The next person gets to take their credit card out. The next person gets to take their credit card out. And the last person to find the answer pays for lunch. And it's always someone who uses a browser. Always, because the apps know. Right, if you have a, if, if he or she asks a sports question and you've got a sports app, see the app can work in the background. The app can start consuming the web right away. The app specializes in sports. Another app will specialize in food. Another app will specialize in science, specialize in outer space. They're better. You understand, every time you go to a browser and you type a search term, the browser has to say, okay, what are you looking for? Here's the whole web, let's see. Here's a whole bunch of stuff that might be related. And <laughs> page three, page four. Sometimes I go to page four just to see who the heck is there, right? The, the web is like high school. You're either popular and get on page one, you're rich enough to buy your way onto page one, or you're invisible. It's crazy. And apps solve that problem. Apps can specialize. You need sports, get a sports app. You need, you need recipes, get a food app. You need to know about outer space, get a space app. They're better. But the problem is, apps have this latent issue. Do you all know about it? It's called zombies. <laughs> apps have a zombie problem, and it's going to kill them. Have you all seen this movie? Have you seen this movie? It's the best movie ever made. <laughs> and I can prove it. Because number one, it's got zombies in it, and zombies people are real. Not like that stupid vampire stuff we had to sit through a few years ago. The only reason we watch those vampire movies is because they were sexy. <laughs> vampires are made up, zombies are real, the apocalypse is coming. You need to watch every single movie about zombies, or I might have to kill you one of these days in the apocalypse. Don't let that happen. Watch this movie. The second reason this movie is the best movie ever made is because it's got Brad Pitt in it. It's like zombie movie meet date night. And there I was at my, with my date watching this movie, and I'm like, oh, it's zombies. And she's sitting next to me, she's like, oh, Brad Pitt. And then something amazing happens. A girl I'm with pulls out her cell phone and begins to glance at it, right? Brad Pitt, cell phone, Brad Pitt, cell phone. And I'm sitting next to her thinking, what the heck is going on here? He could take his shirt off any minute and you might be glancing at that phone, are you crazy? And then it got worse. I hear her going, wait for it, wait for it, wait for it. And then she taps me on the knee and says, I'll be right back. And she leaves the movie theater during this most perfect movie. I'm stunned, flabbergasted. Wondering how my taste in women deteriorated to this point. And then she comes back in, she's kind of out of breath, and she sits down. She's, and, and, and you've right, she missed several minutes of the movie. I'm expecting at any minute her to turn to me and say, What did I miss, right? She never said it. So I thought, okay, I'll be proactive. And I said, hey, you didn't miss anything. And she said, and I quote, I know, because she has an app that tells her when to pee at the movies. <laughs> There's an app for that. Somebody has watched every single minute of every single movie, and they go, oh, here's an exciting, don't pee during that part. Right, new character to this, don't pee there. And here's four minutes, right in the middle, 
totally go, go take a lead. <laughs> now, I ask you, how many of y'all go to the movies? Just raise your hand if you're movie really goers. So I think it's safe to say we all go to movies, right? How many of y'all have this ad? <laughs> this, my friends, is the ad zombie problem. This is called the ad discoverability problem. There's an app there that at some point everybody could use and no one knows about. And that's what's going to kill the app store. The app store, 1.4 million apps, that it's just as undiscoverable as the web. It's just as hard to find the information and the functionality you need because there's too much of it. And we don't know. And we're busy. And we can't keep track of all this stuff. So where does technology go from here? How do we solve the app discoverability problem? Can't go to the web anymore. It's too much stuff there. It's too hard to find. The app store, same problem. Too hard to find. Why do we even need apps for this? Why can't my device do this? Why can't my, for example, Windows phone, why can't my Windows phone geolocate me and realize I'm in a movie theater? It can. Right? They can geolocate me within a few feet. They can look up that address and say, ah, James is in the IPIC movie theater in Redmond, Washington. Microsoft Research owns the patent for geolocating me off the face of the planet. It knows I'm on the second floor. Bing has the capability of understanding. It knows the interior layout of most buildings in the first world. Aha, James is in theater number four. I haven't, haven't used an app yet. I haven't used anything. My phone's done all this. What's playing in theater number four? My phone can look it up, find the answers. Ah, oh, James, James hasn't been moving for 30 minutes. He's clearly <laughs> watching a movie. We know what movie he's watching. It's World War Z. Oh, wait a minute. James bought a beer before he went into high school. We haven't geolocated James in a bathroom for two hours. <laughs> And, and we're gonna, and so this would be right. I would, all I'd have to do is pull out my phone and say, Cortana, I gotta pee. And Cortana's gonna say, Yeah, I know. I, I watched you. I know exactly. I, and just wait three minutes, and then you can go and pee. Right? That's how technology is going to work. It is going to come to us because we don't need an app for that. The web. Understand what's happening here. The web is moving in the background. The web is just a data repository. It's no longer a destination in this future. We don't need an app. Apps are moving in the background. We don't need it. Apps are verbs now, not nouns. We don't need the app. Who cares about the bits on the phone that has a little app? All I need to know is when to pee. <laughs> That's the functionality. Tell me when to pee. I don't need the app. I don't need to search. My machine is searching for me now. My machine is Googling, my machine is Binging. Do you know that our kids don't say Google anymore? Google started as a noun, a company, and then it turned into a verb, synonymous with search. You ask a 10-year-old, a 12-year-old to, to, to find some information, and they don't say, I'll Google it. They don't say, I'll Bing it. I wish they said they Bing it, but they don't. <laughs> they say, I'll look it up on my smartphone. That's what kids are saying now, because they realize the phone knows it's doing all the work. It's the devices that are becoming more important now than the data. It's the devices that are figuring the world out for us. Our phones and the machines that we carry, I'll talk about the rest of the machines in a bit, they are going to be processing the world for us. Our phone is going to be on alert. Where, where is my user? What is my user doing? What is, where is my user going? What's the destination in their GPS? What's on their calendar next? What are they doing? What are they doing? How can I help? How can I help? Just in case you might need anything. Here it is, just in case. And this is the future. And every single version of the, of the phone operating systems and the devices that we will wear are going to be monitoring our environment for us. And just in case we might need something, they're going to figure it out and it's going to be there. So that when you say, when can I pee, we're going to know immediately. There's not going to be some connection to some server and some, well, let's figure this out for it. It's going to be immediate because our devices will be anticipating our needs and making sure that we have the information that we might need. Now, the smartphone is one thing, but the smartphone is probably going to go away because all machines are coming online now. My boss had the audacity last summer to say, James, you need to take a vacation, dude. You have, you've been working, you haven't taken a vacation in two and a half years. You need to take some time off and go have some fun. And I said, I don't like having fun. 
fun and boring. So I took some time off and I wrote some code. <laughs> and I put my hot tub on the Internet of Things. Seriously. My hot tub is now on the Internet of Things. It's very lonely because there's no other hot tubs out there for it to talk to. But, but my hot tub can monitor its own water quality. My hot tub can open and close its own lid with a little Windows phone app. And, and, and my, my, it can order chemicals right, from Amazon. And I'm, I'm expecting Amazon to have the drones one of these days. Right? So I thought the drone will just fly over and just squirt the chemicals <laughs> right in. So that's why I, could, I do the you know, run a little code of open and close my hot tub uh, using an app. Um, but I also thought, well, I don't want it to squirt the hot, you know, if there's an occupant in the hot tub, I don't want it to just squirt the chemicals. <laughs> Depending on the occupant, though. I, I, might, I might need to do a little identity research here. Um, but I thought, so I, I put in a, a water level sensor so it knows when someone's in because the water level rises. And it's funny because I was traveling in Europe and I get this, uh, this notification on my phone and said, hey, the water level just rose in your hot tub. And I thought, oh, somebody's sitting in my hot tub, wonder who it is. So I do the math, the water displacement, and, <laughs> and I'm thinking it's probably my kids, right? But the math doesn't add up. It's heavier than my kids. And I do the math and I realize, wait a minute, it's my daughter's weight plus someone who weighs about 165 pounds. <laughs> it's Dylan. <laughs> Close lid. <laughs> and it worked because she texted me and she said, Dad, your hot tub's gone crazy. You closed the lid on me. And I said, no, honey, my hot tub is protecting your chastity. <laughs> But think about this for a second. Think about what's happening here. Because what if all the machines were online and they could talk to each other? What if everyone's hot tub was online and they could compare notes? My hot tub could say, hey, I'm, I'm getting, I'm buying this chemical, and I'm using it, this is, this is how often I apply it, and, and I'm getting this much water quality out of it. Another hot tub could say, well, I'm buying this more expensive chemical, but, but it's lasting longer. And, they could do the math, and the machines are going to know. They're going to understand that's the best chemical combination for our water. They are going to track the data better than any human could do, and they're going to be able to talk. That's the chemical. We're going to buy all that chemical as much as we can, and when that's out, this is the second best chemical company to work with. This is the third best. These are the best chemical repair people. And these aren't going to be Yelp reviews of humans saying, I didn't like the way that person looked. I'm pissed off. These are going to be machines with actual data. We are going to know what the best chemicals. You can't advertise to machines. Look, where do all the marketing and advertising people do now? The machines are going to say, hey, yeah, we want to sell you this chemical. And the machine's going to say, no, I'm smarter than you are. I know what chemical to buy. I know where to get it. I know how to get it. We don't need humans anymore. Imagine your toaster being online. What in the heck does a toaster have to do on the Internet of Things? Here's what a toaster has to do on the Internet of Things. One of these days, your toaster is going to wake up, and it's going to realize its voltage has been high for four straight days. Something's gone wrong. And it's going to talk to all the other toasters on the Internet of Things and say, something's wrong with me. <laughs> and the other toasters are going to look at the data and say, dude, because I'm convinced all the machines are going to call each other dude. <laughs> and thanks, it's going to say, dude, you are dying. <laughs> you have a filament that's wearing thin, and based on the data, you have six days to live. <laughs> and that brave little toaster, uh, see, that's how I find out who the parents are. <laughs> that brave little toaster is going to have to order its own replacement. <laughs> And then one of these days you walk in and you press the little button to toast your toast and nothing happens because your toaster's broke and at the very moment UPS arrives, ding dong, and there's the replacement right there on your doorstep. And it's going to be, a, it's going to make its own decision about what to, it's going to monitor your brand loyalty and you know that, I want, he wants that brand of toaster. Or it's going to be, for you, you for example, uh, it's going to have a very colorful, wonderful, stylish toaster for you. But you, sir, you're just going to get the gray ordinary one. Right? <laughs> they're, they're going to know. They're going to understand this. And they are going to figure this out and make decisions for us. 
you, you fast forward into the future, even a few years, all of our devices are self-maintaining. All of our devices order their own replacement parts. This summer, I'm going to install a 3D printer in my, uh, in my hot tub. And I'm going to print seals because I found out if it's got high voltage, that means your bearings and your seals are wearing. They need to be replaced. And it can now text my hot tub repair person, Pat, who thinks my hot tub is crazy, right? And, and say, hey, I need my seals and bearings replaced. But I think if you fast forward a few more years, every single device that we have with replaceable parts is going to have a 3D printer embedded into it, and it will repair its own replaceable parts by 3D printing them. Do you know it used to be we could just 3D print with plastics. We can do it with rubber now. We can do it with metal now. We can do it with food now. That's right. We are going to be able to 3D print a meal within the next 10 years because we can do this. And we are going to be able to 3D print with, with common molecules and particles. It's going to be stunning. We are not going to have to do anything in this future. You know, in China, they have 3D printers on wheels that print houses. They roll over a spot and just start printing the foundation. They start printing the walls. These are hurricane proof. These are earthquake proof. These are everything. It, zombies, not so much. Zombies, I have another talk on how to survive a zombie apocalypse. That's not today, but you invite me back. So beyond that, we get to a point where we really don't need any of you all. His answer of, oh, yeah, you're still going to need, no, 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 BS. Humans are not going to be necessary in this future. All of our machines are going to take care of themselves. If you have a job that it has anything to do with using or repairing or maintaining or making parts for machines, you are not going to be necessary anymore. If you're in advertising, if you're in marketing, you're not going to be necessary anymore. Come on. This is just the truth. We have been destroying, the technology industry has been destroying and creating jobs and changing the way the economy works. Used to be people could make money with taking pictures. It used to be companies like Eastman Kodak would employ hundreds of thousands of highly paid middle class jobs. Right? We had photographers, we had wedding photographers, we had Fujifilm, we had film developers, we had all these jobs, all that wealth now concentrated in the 13 employees of Instagram. Music. Musicians can't make money anymore because of technology. There will never be another Beatles. There will never be another Led Zeppelin because of technology. They shift, right? The jobs are different now. The jobs are programming. The jobs are technology. The jobs are building these machines. But once the, job, the machines are built, what do we need humans for? Well, let's talk about that. How will money be made in the future? If we look at the past, the web was clear, easy call advertisement. Easy call. Because the web is perfect for ads. It's perfect. Web is like the NFL. We play for 10 seconds and then we stop. <laughs> and we have a bunch of commercials so we can make some money. Then we play for another 10 seconds and whoa, we got to pay for that 10 seconds. We stop. And a bunch of commercials. Come on, you watch. You never watch the Seahawks play more than 11 seconds before you can stop and do something else. The web works just like that. Search term, search results page, click another page, stop, start, stop, start, stop. It's perfect for advertising. Advertising professionals have had it so easy for so long because it's perfect. Ads not so much. I'm sorry, apps not so much. Apps are harder. Apps are like soccer. Right? Those people never stop kicking that little ball. They can go days without scoring, and they still kick the ball. And soccer aficionados don't, they, they're interested in it anyhow. They don't care that they haven't scored for a month or two. They're, oh, they might score any minute, and they can't take their eyes off of it. And there's no place for ads. You can't walk out on a soccer field and say, hey, guys, time out. It, it's been, what, 40 minutes before we <laughs> made money. We can't do this, right? It's America. We got to fund the golfers. And so in soccer, they got to be clever. They got to put, put ads on the jersey. They got to hide ads like behind the coach's box, anywhere the camera might happen to pan. Oh, there's an ad. 
and apps will have to do the same thing. Right? You launch that app for a reason. You got that little bitty screen. There's no room for an app. And, and you're concentrating on the app. You're either playing a game or you're getting some value out of it. You can't annoy people with that. So, so advertisers have had to play the same games with ads, and it's getting harder. It's getting a lot harder to do. So now this whole purchase economy is kind of, I will pay 99 cents for an app to make the ads go away, and we do this. I, one of the former speakers said something about so many billions of dollars that Apple has given away for, for apps. And that's purchases. That's in-app purchases. That's people making the ads go away. And the purchase economy is now taking over. We are willing to pay for value. Now, this purchase economy, I think, is going to pick up. If you look at a company like Twitter, Twitter is in battle, right? The CEO is being replaced. They can't figure out how to make money. The advertisement's not working. But they're going to wake up one of these days. I just wrote a blog post called Twitter is Stupid. Um, which trended on Twitter, which I just found so <laughs> ironic and beautiful. Uh, but if you search for Twitter, it's stupid. You can read about this. But here's the idea. There are buyers and sellers sitting inside of Twitter right now. And Twitter's like, well, we're going to advertise to you anyhow. I know you're in Twitter and you want to buy what she has to sell, and you're in Twitter too. But would you like to buy a refrigerator instead? Right? It's stupid. So this is how all these communities are going to work in the future because the ads economy is dying. I, I did this tweet last year. Traveling to Boston and New York City next week, any locals who can hook me up with some live music recommendations? And it turns out I got no replies. None of my thousands of followers had any idea what I, two people favored it. I have no idea why two people were favored. Ha ha, James can't find no music favorite. <laughs> right, there are plenty of people inside Twitter who can help you. And this is a hint on how the economy, if you want to make money in the future, you are going to have to be able to inject value into these online ecosystems. So I wrote a little code, because that's what I do when I get pissed off. <laughs> make me take a vacation. And, and so I, I figured, all right, this is easy. Bing, Bing takes search terms and figures out intent. I gave this to Bing, and Bing said, you're interested in live music venues in Boston and New York. Right? This isn't rocket science. And then I searched through all the online accounts looking for live music venue, a music hall, uh, live music, Boston, New York, all these search terms. Found about 1,300 Twitter accounts that claim to be live music venues in Boston. New York, and I just sent them this tweet. Easy, right? It was literally about 20 lines of code. It took me about an hour, maybe two hours, because I'm not that good, as good as I used to be. It took me half a day, maybe, tops. And then, and then I sent out, okay, maybe it took me a full day, but okay, maybe, maybe, I'm not as good as I used to be. And, um, and so, it, the funny thing, within one minute, look at this, one minute, one minute, one minute, I got 15 replies back within one minute saying, hey James, come here. You can't, and Twitter couldn't figure this out. Twitter's got buyers. Twitter's got sellers. And they're ignoring each other. They can't find each other. This is how the future is going to work. Buyers and sellers connected immediately through tools like Twitter and Facebook and Snapchat, etc. There's intent to buy. We are going to get that intent to buy, match it with the people who are intent to sell, and then left swipe, right, right swipe, right, no, make that go away. I don't ever want to see that again. Right swipe, I like it very much. Thank you. All right, like this one. That Hyatt Regency Boston is recommending uh, jazz music. Next thing you know, they're going to be want me to drink wine. Are you kidding me? <laughs> left swipe. <laughs> the Boston Symphony is talking about talking about uh, classical music now with the legalization of marijuana. I'm thinking classical music has a good future, a very good future. But left swipe, sorry, not quite ready for that. But look at this. The Orpheum Theater has got good, solid alternative rock and roll. Cage the Elephant and the Foles. I've seen them both in Seattle. I can buy tickets now. Right swipe, connect it to them, buy tickets directly inside of Twitter. So watch for this purchase economy emerging. These companies are going to be dying based on their ad revenues, and they're going to have to provide actual value, <laughs> not just advertised value. And there's actual value in Twitter. There's actual intent to purchase. There's actual intent to connect. Facebook and Twitter can't be that stupid. 
for that much longer. And the as economy is going away because it completely goes away in this device economy. How do you advertise to a hot tub that knows the truth? How do you advertise to a toaster who knows what their person will like, right? And what their brand loyalties are. Our devices are gonna figure this out. And, and you're gonna get, so this micropayment idea, let's talk about that for a minute. Let's say, let's find somebody with some, uh, with some good uh, fashion sense. Why is this so difficult? Let's find some people with some. There she is, look at her in the purple. That's gorgeous. Now let's say I'm walking around and I say, I've got to know where you got that dress. I want to buy one just like it. But see, in the future, that dress is going to be on the Internet of Things. That dress is going to have nanofibers woven in it that can compute. That dress is going to know where it can be purchased. That dress is going to be, know all of these things. And I won't have to come up to you and be creepy and say, oh, beautiful dress, right? All I have to do is there's going to be a gesture button or a something I can just kind of wave in your general direction and it's going to say, okay, there's the dress. Here's where you can buy it. Uh, it'll know my size. Well, maybe I picked the wrong one. Well, hey, this is okay. If Caitlyn Jenner can do it, I can do it too. <laughs> it's going to know. It's going to order it. And more likely, it's going to 3D print it at home. And then you get a micropayment for that. Right? You were the referrer of the dress. We understand you bought the dress. Without your identity, without any personal information, we can have this transaction. You don't even know I bought it, and you get a payment from the company, or you get a discount from the company, or something like that. Right? You take the run key example. This person watched every movie, knows exactly when to pee, and if I'm sitting there saying, can I say, Cortana, I gotta go. Cortana's gonna say, I know, it's okay. I'm on, I'm on this, wait two minutes and then you can go. And then I walk out and go, right? Which means I'm consuming the value generated by someone else. That person deserves a micropayment. <laughs> that maybe it's a, right now you gotta buy that for 99 cents and none of you all have it. That guy's not making any money. Every one of you are a potential customer. No one's buying. He's not making any money. But what if that was a, maybe it's an old movie. World War Z's been out for a long time. Maybe that's a four cent P. <laughs> or maybe it's the world premiere of The Hobbit. That's a 25 cent P. And every time someone consumes that value, he's going to get paid. Turns out all that data is up in Azure. Azure is a subscription model. And you, that, that person has just generated value for Azure. Why wouldn't Microsoft be willing to pay them a micropayment when that value is consumed? This is the economy of the future. The economy of the future is your ability to inject value that then other people consume. And the systems track. Azure will track this. Office 365, all of these big platforms, Facebook, Twitter, are going to be tracking this and paying micropayments to the people who, uh, who, who reject value. It's a value economy that we're merging to, not an advertising economy. Now, subscriptions really become important in the device economy. They're really important in the, in the Internet of Things as well. And let's face it, you all are all paying subscriptions out the wazoo. See, that's nice. This vision of the future requires no additional money. You're already paying Comcast monthly. You're already paying Spotify monthly. You're already paying Netflix monthly. You're a Microsoft customer. You're paying for Office 365 on subscription. You're paying for Azure on subscription. There's money already in this ecosystem. And so that's how it's going to be going to be divvied up. You are going to subscribe. Ownership is going to go away. Right? The sharing economy for the Internet of Things is already in full scale. I was in um, in LA for the last two days. And I used Uber something like 14 times. I got a taxi on the way from LAX to my hotel. It was $65. I got Uber on the way back. It was 15 He stopped once and picked up somebody else. This is crazy. right? Look at all those cars out there. Why are we still using taxis? Airbnb, share your home. Do you know there's an Air P and P? If you're driving down the road and think, I gotta go. Why do all my examples have to do with the urine? What, what is wrong with me? Airbnb, and there's, there's gonna be a house in the neighborhood willing to rent out their bathroom for 50 cents for a buck and a half, right? My hot tub will be able to advertise itself on the web. Hey, anybody wanna soak? I got you covered. 
And why wouldn't I want to do that when my hot tub's completely self-maintained? Everything's going to be shared in the, in the future. Ownership is going to go away. We're going to share cars. We're going to share rooms. We're going to share houses. We're going to share household goods. Share, share, share. Um, buying is, is, is going to be a thing in the past. Now, here's where it gets really complicated. What about machines? What happens when this Internet of Things is in full scale? What happens when the machines take over? What happens when the machines get to the point, you asked about the singularity earlier, what happens to the, when the machines get to a point that they are better at managing our lives than we are? That they are better at managing the planet than we are? I think it's the machines are going to figure out global warming. They're going to absorb all the data and they're going to say that, that, that are the sources and here's how to fix it. It will be fixed in the year 2419. That's when the, the whatever it is, right? They're going to figure it out. The machines are going to know more about us, and the way we live, and the planet we live on than we will. And right now, the machines are doing some amazing things. The gentleman from the Allen Institute, uh, he's from the AI part, the brain science part, holy cow. What, what they're doing is amazing. We are using machines to figure out the human brain. We are using machines, just like we used machines in the 1990s to map the human genome. And we did this. By the way, the Human Genome Project started in 1990. Do you know it was supposed to, originally supposed to be a 100-year project to map the human genome? We did it in 13. Done. Completely done to the point that we canceled the project because there wasn't anything left to do. We are now mapping the human brain with that same veracity, except our machines are a lot better than they were back then. That Windows phone, I might say I said it twice. This is a, we could do a little branding exercise here <laughs> for our host. That Windows phone that I have over there on my chair is more powerful than any computer that existed in 1994, including Cray supercomputers. Our supercomputers are really powerful now, and we are using those machines to map the human brain. So this, the, this idea that the singularity is going to occur, and the machines are going to wake up, and they're going to be pissed off and start killing us, I don't see it either. right? Although, I, I do think that we ought to take Wikipedia offline. <laughs> Seriously, because, because if, if the machines wake up and, and read Wikipedia, they're going to say, these humans are bastards. <laughs> it's like war and Kardashians, and, and it's just awful. They need to be exterminated. So we just need to just to hedge our backs. Let's just you know, make sure that, that they don't really know how bad we are. I think it's much more likely that the machines are going to be used to map the human brain, and, and I agree with Oren that the brain is the most complicated, most capable, and gray matter is going to beat silicon when it comes to intelligence, and we are ultimately going to win. Now, that's not without risk either, right? If we begin modifying our brains with machines, or we begin growing our, our brain capacity, that's kind of a scary future, because we know how technology tends to trickle down. People who can afford it get first, and then the people who can't afford it have to wait for the next versions, have to buy used equipment. Right? That's the real danger of the singularity, is creating two different types of human beings. One, type, one class of human beings whose brains have been modified to be super intelligent, and another class of beings who can't afford it, right? That's a recipe for a revolution. Ask the French how that turned out for them, right? When the, the human modified machines say, let them eat cake, that's when you need to run for the hills. That would be worse than the zombie apocalypse. World War III won't be between nations. World War III is between, between species. I don't know how to make money in this. Every time I think about it, there's simply no money to be made, right? Mathematics is a problem that machines are going to be better at, and we don't need to do it anymore. Manufacturing, the machines are going to be better, we don't need to do it anymore. Engineering, the machines are going to be better at, we don't need to do it anymore. I don't know about making money. I'm not even sure what we're going to do, right? Are we going to be happy as a species in this easy life? Where money isn't necessary, and we can sit around and talk about art <laughs> and philosophy. 
Is that the future of humanity? I think not. And this is what I want to close on. I think when the machines release us from the mundane, when the machines do the math and the engineering and those parts, we are going to be what we were meant to be. Explorers, frontiers people. We are going to map our galaxy. We're going to heal our planet. We are going to colonize other worlds. We are going to push the boundaries of our species just like our ancestors did when they crossed the ocean. We are explorers at heart. Maybe, just maybe, heaven isn't something we were meant to find. Heaven is something we were meant to create. My name is James Whitaker. I work for Microsoft. Thank you very much. in between you and lunch, but I just got the nod that it's okay for me to take a couple of questions. Uh, do you have any? You don't have an app that knows that already? <laughs> an, an app that knows your questions? Uh, yeah. Not that I can talk to you about. Uh, yes, ma'am. said, why do you call it a phone when no one talks on it? Yeah. It is. <laughs> they won't call it a phone. So, so let, me, let me give you another prediction that usually isn't part of this talk. You're getting a little bonus on another one. Right? Where, are the computer, where are, the, are the computers that we use now going to go? Right? The computers on our desk, the computers in our lab. Um, Hand me my Windows phone there, would you, would you please? Thank you. See, I said Windows phone for the third time. I'm totally going to get a bonus for this. Um, so this machine, do you understand why this machine is so large? It's, it's large for one reason, because it has a screen. And it has to have a battery to support the screen. Most of your battery power on your device goes to making this screen bright. When the screens are gone, this thing is about the size of, if you if you're, uh, have large hands, it's about the size of your pinky. If you have small hands, it's about the size of your index finger, right? That's the amount of electronics to do the computing, not just to support the machine. And there's hardly any browser. That's how these things are going to get so small they're going to be in. I mean, I, I'm going to be able to fit a supercomputer in the heel of my chucks, right, in, in, the next, in the next few years. And it's going to be able to do everything. Um, so, so the screens are going to go away. The screens will be things like the HoloLens. I'm so glad that was that was demoed because I don't know if you've had a chance to play around with HoloLens, but it's a it's a screen that appears. You know, we've done the science. We know where to put it so it's for maximum impact. So we're between a few feet away to about 13 feet away, and you'll have a screen anytime you want. In the future, it's probably going to be a contact lens, and it's just going to it's going to just show up. Right? We're not going to need screens. We're not going to be able to carry these things around. You will have a, the, the Bing index, the Bing web index, the Google web index will be embedded in your clothes. You won't have to look anything up. You probably won't even need an internet connection at all, right? And all these machines will collaborate and do things uh, on, on your behalf. So the screens are holding us back. Um, and you know, maybe we won't need to talk to each other. Maybe we'll be able to just do it with the line. I just look at what the Allen Institute is doing right here in Seattle. They're figuring out how to detect thought. Like I said, yeah. <laughs> there's a reason we legalize that stuff first, people. <laughs> yes, sir. So I just wanted to add one more thing to your prediction, and that is that you, you didn't really mention what happens when all people know everything simultaneously, which is that they all trust each other and empathize with you each other and they create a trust bond outside of their existence like you would with your family or something and I think that the result of that is not comprehensible right now. So his point is that you know in, in this future that I just laid out there's all people will know all things at the same time it's gonna be harder to lie right <laughs> it's gonna be it's gonna be harder and, and you're right I, what does that future mean what what kind of 
people do we become? I think it means we move as one, as our cells move as one in our body. I mean, I hope so. I think I hope that that this is the end of things like war and, and strife and, and conflict. Um, but I don't know. I do I do know that if, if I was to go into some cryogenic state and be thawed out in in 50 years, I don't think I'd recognize the planet or be able to interact with the with the planet. It would be completely different. Uh, fortunately, at that time, I could probably just kind of log in and download everything I need to know. Uh, By the way, that's coming. These classrooms that we send our kids to, where they're bored to death uh, and, and learn things over a period, of, this is crazy. Like, we're not going to be teaching people like that, where you have to study. We're going to understand how the brain works to the point that we can download information. And you will quite literally be able to download how to fix your car, fix your car, and then over the next few hours, that information just slowly dissipates because you don't need it anymore. And that's how we'll train our, our children. The education is going to be one of those next markets that fall. Now, the future of education is not school. The future of the education is, I, I learned to code in college, and, and in college, it's a 15-week semester to teach me to code. When in reality, that's a two-day two days worth of intensive study. We're sending our kids to school so that they can learn the slow way, so that the college dropouts can come and take their jobs, right? Because if you have, if it takes you 15 weeks to learn anything, that's way too slow. Yes, sir. You mentioned about injecting value for all of us to inject value into our lives. That's how we make more value. To inject value into the ecosystem. Into the ecosystem. Right. Her, right. her dress is value into the ecosystem. That's right. I predict in the future there's going to be more people that dress like her and fewer people that dress like. You, sir. You know, I believe that. <laughs> Dave, Dave, I believe that. Dave, I believe that after this talk, more people will dress like her even now. Like after your talk, more people will dress. Like her. But my question is, here we are as professionals. How into our I actually teach a course in innovation at Microsoft. Uh, teach it monthly. How to, how to be creative and how to be innovative. Because I'm convinced that being creative is not a talent or a skill. Yeah. It is actually a way of life. It's a lifestyle. And and so you know if you're you have to finally tune yourself to look for what are the problems, what do people need. This is what entrepreneurs do, right? Snapchat, take, take Snapchat as an example. No one was asking for Snapchat, but everybody was telling, you, oh, you kids, stop taking pictures of your junk and putting it on Facebook. That's a bad idea, that sticks around, you'll never get a job, stop doing it. I'll tell you what, whenever you tell a teenager to stop doing something, <laughs> They do it more, right? That's a business opportunity. And all Snapchat did was replicate Facebook and, and, and make things self-destruct after eight seconds. It's, it's a, a 200 lines of code addition, and they're worth billions of dollars. So it's, it's the ability, and that's what we really need to be teaching our kids. Our kids, there is, there, it has never been less useful to learn math. It has been never left. Reading, writing, and arithmetic are the old, old way to do it, right? It, it's coding, it's creativity, and it's value injection. And that's the kind of things we need to be teaching at our schools. I think I'm done. Thank you all very much. <laughs>